On this Memorial Day weekend, I think it's appropriate that we consider and celebrate not only the, those who have sacrificed their lives to give us freedom in our country, but to consider the freedom that Jesus has given us because of his death, a freedom that cannot be taken away by government or the strong but one that we are, in fact, free indeed. So I want us to consider that as we look at this passage and a number of others. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 23. This is Paul writing, For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, when we read that, we could think, well, our job is just to remember that he died. I'm going to be a little crass here. Everyone dies. In Genesis, we see how various men lived to 800 plus years, but then it says, and he had sons and daughters, and he died. And he would live 500 plus years, and he had sons and daughters, and he died going right on through to today's world. We're going to be celebrating uh, those who gave their lives, and often many of those men and women were between 18 and 21, and they died. We have all had friends and family members who have died. There's even those who are unborn, killed by the people that would be the one who would most protect them. They've died. As a matter of fact, as I counsel some people because they're, they feel very uncomfortable about doing estate planning because it could cause their death. And I will state, in all of recorded biblical history, there's only two people who never died. Enoch and Elijah. Enoch walked with God and was no more. And Elijah, because Jezebel threatened his life and said, if he uh, wasn't dead by this time, may something terrible happen to her. God took him up in a chariot of fire and then saw to it that her prophecy was fulfilled. And as I tell them, there's only two people who never died. They're not with us. The point of remembering Jesus' death is not that he died, but why he died. And the reasons that it gives us in that death. So, if you'll, again, we're going to look at Romans, and several passages in Romans and a couple of others. Right off the bat, in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, it says this, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So right off the bat, we are told that Christ died not for the good, not for the godly, not for the righteous, but for the ungodly. And in case you haven't figured it out yet, that's you and that's me. We're the ungodly. And it says we were helpless. We could not become godly by our own. It's for that reason Christ died for us. For the one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone might, would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his lo own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we remember his death because we were the ungodly, and we were sinners, but at the right time, he died for us. So when we take the bread and the cup, we remember his death, because it caused us to be now godly and righteous. It is what 
his death represented. And then we're going to jump over to Romans chapter uh, 6, verse 23. And it says this. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we earn wages in sin. And that wages that we earn is death. But it said because of the death of Christ, we now have eternal life. So when we remember his death and we declaim and proclaim his death, it's because we state that we now have eternal life. He gave his life that we might have life. And so as I keep saying, we do not live, die, and live again. We have eternal life. To be absent from the body simply means that to be present with the Lord. There is no soul sleeping. There is no pause. There is always life. And so we should remember that life because as we come to the table, we remember his death because of that. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, if you can only remember one section of the Bible, I commend to you Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is kind of like the cliff notes of the Bible. If you study it, you'll kind of get the whole context of the scriptures. But the first verse starts off by saying, Therefore, because of Christ's death, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We come in to celebrate not because we are sinless, but because there's now no condemnation. We are not condemned by our sin because of the death of Jesus. So all too often we come to the table with great sadness and, and rightfully so in a sense that it's because of our sin and ungodliness he was required to die. But because of his death, we're no longer condemned. So when someone says you're not worthy, Jesus says shut up and because I've made you worthy. Jump over to Romans chapter 10, starting with verse 8. And these passages are my wife's favorite verses. All I got to do is get there. All right. Verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth. Now, again, I want you to notice it's confess. If you're arrested for something and you didn't do it, you don't confess. Because you're not guilty. If you are guilty of something, police officer, I'm going to pick something like a police, you're kind of inattentive and you run a red light and it gives you a ticket and you show up in court hoping that the cop won't be there and he shows up. So you go, well, I'm stuck. So you go, I'm guilty. I confess I ran the red light. That's confession. So if you confess, this means it has already taken place. So if that if the word of faith, which is we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord. He's my boss. He's my instructor. He's my rabbi. He's my Lord. If you confess, that means that he is that. Otherwise, it's not a confession. So if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we declare his death, not because he died. We declare his death because he rose again. And in that belief, 
we are saved. And thanks be to God that that's the case. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. I want you to notice something. The world has a real hard time with this. I mean, all you got to do is believe in Jesus and all you got to do is confess and, you, and you're going to be saved? The answer is yes. It's that simple. And it's also that hard. Because we, no matter how many songs we hear about Jesus take the will, we don't want him to. We want to control our own lives. We want to, and it's only when we're about to hit a wall in our lives that we say, Jesus, take the wheel. But the scripture says, if you confess Jesus as Lord, which means he's the boss, always. And if you believe that God raised him from the dead, we're saved. So it is as simple as that. And coming to the table to declare his death causes us to declare, I'm saved because I believe and I confess. Now we're going to jump over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, verse uh, 14. Easy for you to say, not so much for me. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. We believe this, but also those who have passed away, who have fallen asleep before us, those who have believed Jesus is bringing back with him. So when we declare his death, we are Not only declaring that he saved us, that he also saved those who have passed away before us. And not only did he save them, he's bringing them back. And that's the second part of when we take the table and the elements, it says that we declare his death until he comes. And so declaration of his death means the declaration of those who believe and the declaration that they are coming with him. And finally, the last verse we're going to take a look at briefly is Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And it says this. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So again, we acknowledge that this life is not ours, that we have been crucified just as Christ has been crucified, and that he is alive because he's alive in me. And that I live this life not for myself, but for him, because he gave himself for me. So yes, when we come, we declare his death, but it's not he died. It's the implications of his death. It's the doctrines that are taught. It are all of those things so that when we come, there is a sense of sadness because of the necessity, but there's a sense of statement of faith that it's because we believe that we have this no condemnation, that we have this eternal life, that we have this forgiveness, that we are now no longer ungodly or unworthy that we are righteous because he died and God rose him from the dead. So I want us to take one more look at the scriptures back at 1 Corinthians again. And it says, For I received from the Lord which I also did deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, Now, again, I want you to notice that Paul here is saying, I didn't get this from Peter 
or the other guys who are at the Lord's Supper. Jesus himself taught me this. In the night in which he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we take these elements, it's not, oh, it's about the time of the day or it's the first Sunday of the month or whatever, but it, we are to acknowledge that when we do so, that we are consuming the body of Christ. Now, there are a number of different doctrines and philosophies about what the elements mean. Our Catholic brothers and sisters believe that these transubstantiate and they become literally the body and blood. Don't believe that. If I did believe it, I would do what they do and make sure not a drop was spilled and every single piece was done. But that's not. Others say, as we believe, that it's become symbolic, that the bread becomes the symbol of his body and the juice becomes the symbol of his blood. And in case you think, well, that's kind of taking a step down, God treats his symbols seriously. If you don't think so, ask Moses when you get to heaven. Moses, for 40 years, was stuck with a bunch of sheep in a wilderness. And then for 40 more years, he was stuck in, with a bunch of people who were worse than sheep in the wilderness. And he got so frustrated that God once told him to strike a rock because they were complaining about water and water came from the rock. And then God said a second time, speak to the rock. And because he was so irritated by the people, he struck the rock a second time and God forbid him to go into the promised land. We're later told that that rock represented Jesus. You take God's symbols seriously. So even though we don't believe that this actually becomes his body and his blood, it is the same in the significance as if it had. And so, as the scripture says, in the same way he took the cup, and after the supper saying, this is, the cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes you proclaim not just he died, but that I'm free, that I'm no longer a sinner, that I am given eternal life, that others who have believed in him are coming back, and that I will one day see him because he's coming again. Then it warns us, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. This scares a lot of people, and rightfully so, but it's a misreading one that scares them. Because when people see this, they go, oh, then I'm not worthy. And your answer is, most definitely you're not. I've never met a worthy sinner. I've never met a person who is worthy to be granted entrance into the kingdom of God. Because we're all saved by grace. We're all sinners ungodly we are not worthy but he didn't say those who come who are unworthy he said those who take it in an unworthy manner and the unworthy manner is that you don't consider the body and blood of christ and what this symbol means and what it declares that we are worthy because of him and so we take it meaningfully we take it understanding the symbol and we take it declaring our faith in his death and resurrection that he is our lord that we believe that he did in fact was raised from the dead and that we take this an acknowledgement of that and take this in declaration that he's coming again and so we do that with those concepts in mind. Because if you take it in an unworthy manner, you should be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in, doing, in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So when we come to do this, this is a time for self-examination. This is not a time for me to say, I remember all the sins you did. I remember all the sins you did. And boy, you didn't confess that. And you should be lucky. The Lord hasn't come yet. 
It doesn't say that I'm supposed to examine everybody else. I'm supposed to examine my life. I'm supposed to examine my fruit or lack thereof. And I'm to look at my life and examine that in fact, yes, Lord, I am unworthy. But thanks be to God, because Jesus gave me victory because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Because Jesus died according to the scriptures, and we declare that in this event. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. If you don't judge your body and you don't judge this body, there comes condemnation. And Paul says, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick. And a number of sleep means they died. Now, he didn't say they lost their salvation. He said they died. Because again, God takes his symbols seriously. And if you don't consider the blood and the body, then God will judge. Now, on, I guess due to the fact that we've learned our history lessons, even though many of you probably didn't learn the history lessons, we separate the Lord's Supper from other things. And so, if you notice, we didn't have a, a, a bunch of donuts today or, or a potluck. Whatever, because in the early church, they would have what they would call a gopi feast. And instead of it being a potluck, it was kind of a bring your own. So some people would bring some really neat stuff and other people would bring the best that they could and some would be hungry. And they would have this agape feast, this love feast. And in the midst of this love feast, they would participate in the Lord's Supper. And the problem was some people were hungry and others were eating more than they ought to. So we've eliminated that possibility by just having it within the church service. We just take this little cracker, matzah, and this juice, and we do it in closed context so that we don't violate it. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. When you come to the realization who you are and you acknowledge that before God, there's no condemnation. But if in our self-examination we think that we are greater than we are, notice it says in 32, and I know I'm going beyond, but when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. God says, if you don't think you are who you really are and you don't judge yourself, then he'll judge you. and He'll discipline you. Which again is a thing that I will tell people, especially people who are going through marital problems and and they'll come and they'll say well uh, my my husband is this and that and whatever and i'll ask about his faith and either is or isn't or she's not sure or he's not sure and my statement to them is if he's a believer he's in trouble because he's not following the lord if he's not a believer he's in bigger trouble When we consider who we are in this setting and we come to the table understanding that it is Jesus' blood, that it is Jesus' sacrifice, that it is his body broken for us, that it is he who by his stripes and by his scourging we were made whole and healed. By his death we were born again. By understanding this and declaring this, we celebrate the freedom that he has given us. 
at the cross. His blood flowed that we might be made free. He gave his life for our freedom. Not for a moment, not for a decade, not even for a hundred years, but for eternity. That's the meaning. That's the declaration. So we're going to have the band come and sing after the prayer. As we consider what he has done. We consider what the meaning of his death is. And the meaning of his resurrection. And how that applies to you and me. Stand with me as we pray.